This episode of The Clear Out was recorded on the 21st of June 2022 at home in Wicklow. And it is a journey from Irish self-deprecation to international idealism, which is also an expression of personal idealism. And on that journey, I also reassert the mission statement of the podcast and remind myself of the aspiration I had and continue to have for the podcast. And it is tethered to a certain idealistic conviction. So, yes. Now, the international idealism to which I refer is based on a quote from a former um a former egyptian prime vice president sorry a former egyptian vice president and nobel laureate and i came across something he said earlier this week and that's what got the cogs turning around this idea of idealism and i offer that to be an idealist is to be perpetually disappointed (laughs) so it's yeah ironically being an idealist is a way of being very realistic about how the world is um but hoping always hoping for something better um and speaking of which what did one idealist say to the other idealist this is far from ideal to which the other idealist replied you could have put that better boom boom i'm here for eternity (laughs) okay so um so yeah that's what's coming up a bit of doomed idealism um i hope you enjoy what you hear i'll see you there around the corner cheers Gonna change my mind Leaving the dream behind Hi, my name is Dara Clear and you're listening to The Clear Out. How are you today? How's it going? Just check in with yourself there. What's going on for you? Is this is this a good moment? Is this a good moment to listen to yourself? Maybe you don't want to hear what you're saying. Maybe you don't want to listen to that voice inside. Maybe it's all just a bit too much and you need to go and immerse yourself in something on the outside to escape, to escape the voice of indictment, of recrimination, the voice of judgment within. Or maybe it's all good. Maybe, maybe you are enjoying high approval ratings at the moment. Maybe you are enormously impressed with yourself. That's um, that's a position that that, uh, Irish people aren't that comfortable with. (laughs) We have a a a national a national predilection for self deprecation. We we like to take the piss out of ourselves and mockingly throw shade at ourselves the last thing we want to be accused of is being pleased with ourselves <laughs> if that's not if that's not a, a symptom of a profoundly damaged national psyche i don't know what is um it's okay it's okay to like yourself how about that for a message a very gentle a very gentle message maybe that should be a mental health awareness campaign splashed on billboards and on the sides of buses uh all across the country it's okay to like yourself
that wouldn't uh, that wouldn't be that costly, would it? It's okay to like yourself. Five words. Mental health awareness, Ireland. It's okay to enjoy yourself. It's okay to approve of yourself. It's okay to love yourself, to value yourself. It's okay to cherish yourself. <laughs> People would practically throw up at that last one. Are you kidding me? What the hell are you talking about? How dare you? How dare you suggest? We open up that can of worms. We lift the lid on Pandora's box and dare to value ourselves so highly. Only bad things can come from that. Only bad things. Um, yeah. And listen, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm laughing here, but there's a, I believe there's truth in what I'm saying. Um, I think it comes with being a small country, a very small country, and so small, in fact, that Ireland arguably has a, a, a village mentality. Just this, just this fear that the community is so small that anything you do to draw attention to yourself could lead to your doom. <laughs> it could lead to you being kicked out of the village or put in the the town square or the village square, of course, because it's a village, it's not a town. Put in the stocks uh, to be publicly derided and mocked and humiliated and vilified. Um, there's something, there's something in there still. Irish, I, I believe this. I believe Irish people have um, an instinct for familiarity. We have an assumption that instead of there being seven degrees of separation between us and uh, somebody very well known, and never mind very well known any other person in Ireland it's more like we think there could only be two or three degrees of separation that's that's how small it is so and just to give you just to give you an, an example an example um I've never met the president of Ireland but there are family members and friends who are just one connection between me and the President of Ireland. And there's nothing remotely remarkable about that. Nothing whatsoever. That's how small Ireland is. Um, yeah, so there you go. So there's a, yeah, there's a familiarity. We all assume that, Asher, ah, sure, listen, I'm bound to know someone who knows that person. One or two steps of connection is all it takes. That's um, that's all it separates us from from knowing someone who is at the very who is at the very top of the tree. And rather than us maybe feeling elevated by proximity to greatness, it's the opposite. Our projection is that the other person is only one or two steps from us and therefore they are very much mortal and normal and lesser. <laughs> um, yeah, and I mean, I'm not, I'm not being, I'm not being facetious about this. There is a, there's, there's something I actually like about that and 
I think it's it's a it's a healthy deterrent to grandiosity and pomposity um and that that you know that 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 can be i think a very attractive national characteristic just the just the the ability to to keep things real and throw away the nonsense and you'd find that like if you see just for example just for example you see successful hollywood actors irish successful irish hollywood actors uh, i referred to liam neeson recently having heard him on a podcast and again just a very very genuinely self-deprecating just keeping things normal and you'll you'll come across that quality readily in irish people who've succeeded at the highest level um the likes of maybe Killian Murphy or Colin Farrell or Saoirse Ronan. Um, and there's more. There seems to be more coming all the time. More Irish talent breaking through. Um, to such an extent that it's no longer that remarkable. Um, it's just become almost commonplace. Um, but it kind of is remarkable. If you remind yourself how small... Ireland is and how small the, the 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 population is I mean we're talking is is it is it even is it 6 million on the entire island uh, you know including northern ireland um that's not a lot of people it's not a lot of people um yeah so I, uh, I, I I had no idea I was gonna I was gonna drift in that direction, but drift I did as I do. And if you're a first time listener, you're going, "What the hell is this podcast about?" <laughs> and I did I did declare some episodes ago that I I try and make a point of of announcing the sort of mission statement of the podcast every episode, and I simply haven't done that, but. Um, just to just to reiterate the clear out podcast is very simply an hour or so each week dedicated to explorations of wellness mostly personal individual wellness looking at the internal landscape of emotional and psychological well-being uh, looking at healthy habits, healthful habits. But as well as that, looking at all aspects of how we live, all aspects of what we might encounter in the world and how those things impact us for better or worse. And so frequently the topics branch out into the social and the political and the philosophical uh, and very often there are references to movies and references to martial arts because I have a lot of that in my background uh, I'm also I'm also or I, <laughs> I am I hesitate I have also been an actor myself and still I still uh, I still nurture little notions that uh, I'll put my put my toe back in the acting pool and and see if I can jump on the back of a shark to get me to the other side of something resembling gainful employment in that in that field um, and I've written about emotional and psychological well-being on my blog my website theclearout.com that's all going to migrate soon very soon I'm, I'm gonna have a, a one-stop shop for uh, the podcast and pieces that I've written, including occasional bits of poetry and short stories, uh, along with the um, hundred or so think pieces in the area of of well being. Often, often, 
often attached to a sort of a, a confessional um, storytelling kernel from from my own life. Uh, that is typically my starting point. I'm not unique in this regard. Um, that's 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 how we operate, isn't it? Do you, I mean where where do you get your ideas? Where do you get your opinions? Do you wait do you wait for somebody else to tell you what to think? Is that um, is that a good road to go down? Um, I think not. I worry. I worry about the person who can't engage with their own thoughts. I mean, barring barring severe mental illness, um, brain function compromise, that kind of thing. But otherwise, if you're you know if you're operating on a fairly even keel, I expect you to think. <laughs> Don't let me down. Don't let me down. Engage. Engage with that part of your brain. The thinking brain. I think the, um, the, the brain is understood by professionals in the field of neuroscience and behavioral science. Uh, neurobiology. The brain is understa- understood as a, a three-part structure. The thinking brain, the emotional brain, and the primitive brain. And that's the that's the the vertical, the vertical alignment of of the brain. Thinking on top, emotional in the middle, and primitive at the base. And then there's also a a right and left brain alignment, the right and left hemispheres. Uh, and so that's. Um, you know, and each part of the brain has its own its own um, purpose, its own function, its own little operating system, what it's responsible for, that department. And when different parts of the brain are impacted adversely, that of course impacts how we function and how we perceive the world in which we find ourselves. And let me just emphasize that the world in which we find ourselves is also the internal space. What we deal with in our own res- reflective sphere, that internal landscape, which I've referred to many times before, um, that's in the mix. And I'm always interested in that. I'm always interested in what's happening internally. What are you dealing with? What are you coping with? What are you suppressing what lights are you turning on? What lights do you prefer to remain off? How, how is that wellness being managed by you? Anyway, look, that's, um, as ever, I, uh, I, I didn't manage to keep that description of the podcast to a, a, a cogent piece. It, um, it drifted. That's, that's the form I'm in at the moment. This is, I'm still, I'm still dealing with post-COVID brain and post-COVID respiratory system. Um, and you, if, if you haven't heard my voice, you wouldn't know, but this is an impacted voice at the moment. There's still a, a slightly foggy, nasally thing going on here that is, that is a symptom of the the, uh, the 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 covid the old covid assault not quite having left the building it takes time and that's what everyone who's had it keeps telling me it'll circle back it'll circle back which is um i mean that's a that's a that's a horror trope isn't it that's a a bad guy trope in the movies or a monster trope you think you've dealt with the threat you draw that that sigh of relief do you draw a sigh express a sigh (sighs) you're relieved you think the danger has passed we the audience watching think the danger has passed but do we really do we really watching we are used to it now we're programmed to go no hold on hold on they're not really dead they're not they haven't really gone away and then the the threat, the danger, the sinister presence circles back and pounces again. <clears throat> gotcha. So um, coming soon to a, a, a horror show near you, COVID, the return. 
COVID, it never dies. So yeah, that's uh, I've still got a bit of that going on, which is um, it is frustrating. I think that maybe maybe that's um, I've, I've heard friends talk about the the mental component, the mental component to COVID, and maybe that is part of what they were talking about the just the um the sense the knowledge the conviction that okay this is just going to linger linger and linger and not quite let go and so you're never quite out of the woods there's always a sense of compromise there's always a sense of being a little bit under full power and I'll go out and say it I'll say it right now I personally struggle badly with that because a lot of the time most of the time I am fit and well and a huge amount of my sense of wellness is attached to being physically in a good place and I use exercise I use exercise and sport and my own little physical health regimes to keep me on track and to keep my mental health in a good space. And when that is compromised, it definitely affects me adversely and leaves me vulnerable to... uh, to anxiety and to depression and to anger. Um, <laughs> I, I, I sometimes feel like I, I talk about anger a lot on, on, on the podcast. Um, well, maybe that's just been an aspect of the last couple of years. Uh, a, a friend was asking me the other day, a friend, an acquaintance, a parent of a kid at school. It was a, a school event and while something very important and precious was happening with the children he just leaned into me and started chatting away about things um, in the way parents can do at these events and he was asking me uh, so why 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 the podcast and I said oh well you know (laughs) I'm an egomaniac and I just thought this is a great way to uh to have an audience, even if it's only an imagined audience. And it's a great way to spend time with myself. Uh, I didn't say any of that. I said uh, I started the podcast because a friend had encouraged me to do so. Um, and I'd been writing about the same stuff I talk about on the podcast for several years before I launched it. And um that was kind of what I said, and I only realized afterwards that I'd, I'd forgotten one of the reasons I wanted to start the podcast when I did was it, it was very much in the context of the the pandemic and the 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 larger um, negative sort of psychological effects that I perceived the pandemic to be having on everyone, like internationally, just the the squeeze that was being put on people and the 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 panic and the fear and the anxiety um, and all the other impacts, the the, 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 the the loss of work, the loss of income, um, the terrible, terrible personal cost to people who lost loved lost loved ones because of coronavirus or were deprived um, a fitting farewell to loved ones because of the pandemic people whose social lives were completely shut down who lost the face-to-face interaction with people that they cared about um and people who found themselves completely isolated. Uh, all of these things, I just felt I was looking at a a landscape where where people were basically being debilitated socially and psychologically and emotionally over an extended period of time, and being deprived of their 
normal avenues of consolation, their normal avenues of comfort, their normal avenues of bonding and solidarity and shared connection. And really, when I started the podcast, and this might be, <laughs> this is, this is, <laughs> now I'm getting, I'm getting hoisted by my own petard. Um, because I'm, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a claim, and I'm, I'm hesitating because this is, this is the instinct to go. I don't want to, I don't want to, 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 to stand up and, and you know, be proud. Uh, I don't want to be grandiose, but basically, I felt I want to put something out there that's positive, and I want to contribute something that is positive and that will potentially make people feel better and that that is that is that's that that remains that remains um that remains to be true and i stand by that that um aspiration and i think if you and i don't know why you would um you'd have to be a very very big fan you'd have to be a top friend of the tell you if you chose to go back and listen to the 55 56 57 episodes of the podcast that i've done i think <laughs> i th i think um You'd have to, uh, you'd have to go. Yeah, they are positive. It's a positive vibe, and it's it's a positive disposition that I'm sharing and a positive outlook. But it is not one that is dishonest. It is not one that is inauthentic, and it's one that embraces grey areas. It's one that embraces complexity and contradictions. It's one that embraces vulnerability it's one that embraces personal failing on my own part and it's i mean it's it never stops being an attempt to look at the messiness of being a human and the messiness of trying to do well and you know that's an aspect of wellness that uh, I probably don't articulate, but the actual attempt to do well and live well and be well, that is in the mix of a life that is trying to cohere to a concept of wellness. And so, you know, doing well and being well and trying to live well that extends beyond oneself. It extends beyond trying to have a, a perfect physique. It it extends beyond trying to be consistently on message. Um, you know, in in that way, I'm so critical of the sort of the the, the hyper positivity, um, that hyper positivity, which I've seen now more than once described as toxic positivity. Um, uh, what, what I find to be a very one-dimensional and unrealistic uh, presentation of of wellness that's hyper achievement based um, and hyper goal oriented and to me it's just I don't know it 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 it, it never it never chimes well with me and it's. Um, it's just a model that I don't value um, and I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not trying to throw shade on people who advocate that way because it's meaningful to a lot of other people and I would argue that it's, it's meaningful to the people who are doing the advocating um, but f for me it just lacks, it lacks some real nuance, it lacks real... Um, honesty and authenticity 
as I as I conceive of those ideas. And therefore, it um, it does nothing for me. I kind of go, okay, yeah, grand, whatever. Well done, well done uh, with that particular um, Instagram parade. Anyway, look, that's a bit that's a bit snarky, isn't it? That's a bit snidey. Look, I uh, I actually wanted to talk today, and this is this is you know we're talking about the messiness of of humanity. I I want to spend the rest of the episode, and I'm going to try and. You know, how often have I said this? I'm going to try and keep this to about an hour. Um, but no messing. I am on the clock. I've got a very important appointment with my hairdresser. <laughs> I, I've got to be down with Call the Barber in Avoca in uh, 45 minutes. So um, here I sit in hashtag blessed, nursing my post COVID recovery drinking my water, looking out at that lovely sunny day. Um, but I'll be sitting in the barber's chair in about 45 minutes getting scalped. The hair's, uh, the hair's got a bit out of control, lads. And I think for the summer, I want to be shorn. Shorn like a tightly clipped sheep. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I've got half an hour left. I'm going to dedicate that half an hour to um, to just having a look at human relations now i want you to listen to this quote you may know this you may have heard it before um listen to this the ultimate sense of security will be when we come to recognize that we are all part of one human race our primary allegiance is to the human race and not to one particular color or border I think the sooner we renounce the sanctity of these many identities and try to identify ourselves with the human race, the sooner we will get a better world and a safer world. Now that's a quote from Mohammed El Baradi. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his surname correctly. An Egyptian diplomat and a Nobel laureate. He's still alive. He turned 80 the other week happy birthday happy 80th birthday i know i noticed on social media somebody else just turned 80 that's right your favorite and my favorite ex beetle paul mccartney <laughs> he actually never was my favorite beetle um i don't really play that game favorite beetles i'm just not that kind of a beetles fan i mean the beetles don't get me wrong i do love me i do love me a bit of the beetles and I loved, loved that Peter Jackson documentary from uh, late last year, uh, Let It Be. That's what it was called, wasn't it? Let It Be, that's like whatever it was, 500 hours of footage from the Beatles recording Let It Be. That was just a fascinating, fascinating document. And Paul McCartney was revelatory in it, in terms of the just his enormous talent. I mean, all of them, all of them, but... Paul stood out, but he was, you know, he was, he was in a good place. It seemed, you know, poor old John was struggling a bit during that time. But anyway, congratulations, Paul, my friend, um, my friend Angus, divine musician. He is, uh, yeah, long time, long time Beatles fan, long time music fan, a real Angus. How would I describe you? A great musician himself, of course, but. Um, a very i don't know if i describe him as a, a purist in terms of his love of music i don't know if, i don't know if if that does him justice but he what's the he has catholic tastes <laughs> and i i don't mean he likes ostentatious churches and uh religious rituals i mean like he'll listen to anything in in the very best sense you know he'll he just can you know he, he'll hear and appreciate music i mean broadly we're broadly talking across you know the pop rock popular form of music um and angus has been out there for a year or so now pushing his own really good album adhd and he's been getting a lot of airplay uh, on the airwaves in ireland but also I see from his uh, social media campaigns, you know, he's getting on playlists uh, in Australia and other places as well. So it's uh, it's great because he's been a 
hard working musician all his life and uh, deserves deserves his success but in any case angus put up a beautiful version of paul mccartney's maybe i'm amazed uh, on social media there earlier this week so you can find angus there on um, facebook and instagram angus that's a-e-n-g-u-s divine d-e-v-i-n-e and um, yeah a lovely version of maybe i'm amazed so a uh, nice one nice one angus appreciated that very much okay so look let's go back to my my other my other favorite octogenarian mohammed mohammed el baradi el baradi and that that quote which um let's give you let's just give you a quick bit of background among among his many achievements his background was kind of in in law he ended up being the the head of the now I'm gonna I'm, I'm not gonna remember the acronym am I the I E A E is that right? Let me just get this right. The let me see it's something to do with nuclear energy, um, international something atomic energy, international executive for atomic energy. What was it called? Dun dun dun. Apologies, I just need to look it up again. I didn't I didn't have a chance to write it down. I A E A which is the International Atomic Energy Agency. So uh, an autonomous body, an international organization that basically is there to police appropriate use of nuclear energy. Um, if, that's not a, if that's not an oversimplification, established in 1957. And Mohammed El... Baradi served as the head of this organization for three terms, so from 1997 to 2009. And if you quickly throw your head back into the history books, you'll realize that that coincided with the 9-11 attacks on the Twin Towers in New York and the subsequent, um, what? Uh, the subsequent invasion of Iraq by the US and British forces under false pretenses. Is that, um, is that, is that an unfair representation of what happened? Um, and El Baradi was, he was one of the inspectors with um, Hans Blix, if you remember that name. He was one of the inspectors that went in to examine uh, Saddam Hussein's nuclear capabilities and he he believed that they they weren't what the Americans claimed they were, and um, he made himself very unpopular with the U.S. because of that, and they tried to block him subsequently from being re-elected uh, as the head of the of that organization. But um, he has, it seems, a very well-regarded legacy in that area, and um, he served very well and yeah was basically a, a a very credible um advocate for for peace and uh responsible nuclear management management of nuclear energy and he did argue very clearly that that double standard of some countries being forbidden from um producing you know nuclear you know nuclear uh weapons while some others were allowed the privilege of having nuclear weapons to protect their borders he just felt no this is there's a double standard there that's not quite right and because of the strength of his work in that area he won the nobel prize he also played a role in the egyptian uprising of uh, or the egyptian revolt revolution in 2011 was not part of the arab spring was that the start of the arab spring am i misremembering that um where he he was definitely uh, very critical of president mubarak and he stood up and said yeah i'll 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 be available if people want me to to lead if they want me to step into the breach if they're looking for a change of leadership i can be that person um now it didn't pan out that way and when Mubarak was removed he was replaced by uh, President Morsi 
and then he was taken down in 2013 by a coup d'etat and Mohammed El Baredi was involved in that in that uh, coup he consulted with the military and he came in when they took over and was the interim vice president of Egypt but he only stayed in that role for I think it was only about five or six months and then he resigned because he felt that the way that the the subsequent government was going after President Morsi's supporters which led to over 500 people being killed um, El Baredi was I think because of um, his, his, his beliefs and his conscience was like I, I just can't I can't be I can't stand here while blood has been spilt and I'm in a position of power and it's against what I believe and he stood down uh, I think subsequently uh, an Egyptian law professor tried to sue him for abandoning his post and abandoning the Egyptian people but that was uh, that was dismissed in court so um, an interesting character and I came across that quote earlier this week uh, as with a lot of the quotes I often bring up on the on the podcast um it's from from um that daily email i get the word a day email which is um an etymological email it gives me it gives a, a word a day to look at the history of the word and show it in its usage uh, and then there's a quote at the bottom of each email which Sometimes is very germane to things that are happening in the world at the moment, um, and it's usually it's the, the 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 person who is quoted. It's their birthday, the, the on the day of the email. So um, that's why Baradi came up. Um, now that quote, I was just reflecting on it and thinking, okay, so this is, uh, and, and you know, I was kind of okay. I saw him credited as a diplomat, and I thought, okay, well, that's that's a that's a. a a very typically diplomatic thing to say we should all just remember that we're um we're members of the human race that's that should be the focus and the sooner we get to that place of acknowledging what we belong to as one um rather than focusing on the points of difference the greater chance there is for a a happier and safer world and he he was it's funny because the language he used anticipated identity politics and culture wars um because he was basically saying this um the sanctity attached to color and to border is fundamentally not serving us um now i mean i'm obviously i'm paraphrasing but he he actually gave that quote just after the US went into Iraq post 9-11 so that was in 2003 so he'd been through this whole journey of the weapons inspection and then uh, clearly was watching a very hawkish um, American government wanting to go to war and that Bush Blair uh, alliance and the you know the war against terror the alliance against terror and he he had misgivings and the the quote came on the back of that which uh, which makes sense given the context um but i mean there's a, so what, what can you say about that is it yeah you know, on one level like even at first pass when i read the quote the first time i was like yeah it's quite you know it's lovely and it's nice and i i value that sentiment myself but i do on another level think wow it's just it just seems so unrealistic it seems so unrealistic bordering on naive and muhammad el baradi could hardly have been described that way based on what he had been through in his career um and it made me think then as well there's a there's something idealistic about that and of course if you're an idealist and i 
probably am really um i don't think there's a probably there i i don't know i mean i i, I try to look at things in a realistic way i don't i don't want to hide from reality and yet i have a strong idealistic streak in me in terms of in terms of the um that how i'd like things to be and how i think things should be i suppose and there's a there's a strong moral component to that because it's based on what i believe is a better way to be a better way to 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 live to interact to view others a better way to view conflict um and there's an idealism there's definitely an idealistic streak in that and the simple truth is if <laughs> if you have the the good fortune to be an idealist you never stop being disappointed <laughs> that's that's the reality the you know the, the nature of idealism is that it's it, it, it's very much beyond the 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 real scenario um because it's something you know, it, 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 it's a close cousin of, you know, perfection. And it's, a, you know, it, it's in the realms of utopian fantasy. Um, and so what is it then about idealism that is appealing? Because it's, you know, you're, you're destined to fail. <laughs> you're, you're destined not to have your vision realized. Um, and I think for me, the, what I find about having an idealistic bent and an idealistic, uh, an idealistic hinge to my ethics is that it's uplifting and elevating and it asks me to think higher and to think broader and to keep things present in my belief system um things that might not be very cool things like hope and rom you know maybe romanticism um and a certain amount of sentimentality uh and other ideals like decency and nobility and compassion um and i suppose a certain amount of i mean i'm hesitating to say you know righteousness because you know righteousness can be a very ugly sword um it's um yeah i i mean it's, you know right righteousness can take you into sort of sanctimony and an assumption of being better um and i don't really have time for that i think there's something so fallacious and ludicrous about thinking you're better um it's just very dodgy dodgy ground <laughs> so um i don't know it's 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 that's a tricky one that is a tricky one but this is the thing <laughs> it kind of it, it doesn't matter it doesn't matter because in the face of the world's cynicism and venality whether you're better or not you know in any i don't know however you you know you want to choose to measure that very very hard thing to to quantify it's meaningless it's meaningless you know you're 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 a drop of water in an ocean of shit that's a very that's a very ugly metaphor um but <laughs> you know sad, sad, sadly you know the, the history of the world doesn't doesn't bear up uh you know great great optimism for the the triumph of idealists um but the thing is if you're not someone like our friend Muhammad, if you're not someone who's going to actually stand up and say, this is wrong, 
that's not a good way to go there's a better way to go what you know what if anything is swimming against the tide of failure what at all is swimming against the tide of of corruption and defeatism and you know political careerism um and enmity um i really do believe strongly that there's a a value to to standing up and saying to standing up and uh, you know even if it's unfashionable and as i say uncool saying what you really think especially when it's in the favor of the greater good and uh, a larger good and maybe an idealistic good it has its place and you just don't know you just don't know you never know where that's going to land and this this great exercise of faith that uh trying to live well is is that you just don't know you you, you know you, you don't know the ripples of your actions and i i mean it, you know it, i started to kind of veer into karmic territory um but i believe very strongly that if you're trying to live a good life that there's far greater chance of positive knock-on effects all around you even if you're not out there proselytizing even if you're not out there actively trying to be a good Samaritan or dedicating your career to service uh, of others in some way, it, it doesn't, it doesn't I, I don't think it has to be as literal as that at all. I just think conducting yourself a certain way, living a certain way, holding yourself a certain way in life, in a, you know, in an existential sense, that there's... A far greater chance to have a positive impact on the world um and it's not it's not a grandiose ambition it's not about i want to get to that spot it's it's much humbler than that and much less visible and that's where it becomes an act of faith i suppose um but in any case there was another aspect to um Baretti's quote that I was trying that, that 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 struck me before I, I pressed record, and it is in this area of of enmity, of discord, of conflict, conflict with others. I mean, you can you can have conflict, you know, with yourself. I mean, I think we all. There are, well, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> that's a very solipsistic thing of me to say. We all have conflict in ourselves. Maybe you don't. Maybe you're very happy. Maybe you're very happy and good on you. Well done. I'm glad. I'm glad you're at peace with yourself. You're enjoying that treaty. Um, but look, I was thinking often the most intense conflicts are between people who are closest to each other. And so, you know, if you look at maybe India and Pakistan, for example, if you look at the troubles that that haunted and terrorized Ireland for so many years up north and the closeness, the physical closeness uh, of the the combatants involved, um, you know, other conflicts historically between bordering countries where really how how different can those people be across that line on the other side of the line and it got me thinking about like you know i can you know i i, I was thinking about towns and villages where I live um, that are mere miles apart a few kilometers away from each other 
and there is historic and embedded enmity between villages. <laughs> um, you know, it reminded me of that um, that later Asterix comic book. The uh, was it the Great Divide? Is that what it's called? Asterix and the Great Divide, and yeah, it was a. Uh, was it one one village that was split in two, and the the neighbors were all at each other's throats all the time, the the, the neighboring villagers who lived right on top of each other, um, and in the end, uh, I, I think Asterix Asterix's solution was to dig a moat between the two villages and they could cross over when they wanted to be friendly but otherwise they'd be separated and I think one of the the gags in the book was that there was one house that sat directly above the moat so one side of the house was in one village and the other side of the house was in the other village because it was like a a Romeo and Juliet situation Um, so they could each live in their their preferred village but under one roof Um, and I don't know, maybe that's maybe that's the maybe that's the, the metaphor that Mohammed al Baradi was going for. That you know, the world, you know, we, we should embrace this idea of of multiple villages under under one roof and try to live harmoniously. I mean it's I mean, even as I say that it sounds a bit naff. Um it's I don't know, I mean what like it, like it begs the question it begs the question what would what would actually lead that type of change like a universal will to live harmoniously if you look at you know the science fiction movies they'll depict a, an alien threat something otherworldly that threatens the entire species of planet earth and so humans unite um you think of movies like uh denny villeneuve's arrival uh well worth a watch you think of um you think of independence day from 1996 the sort of blockbuster entertainment um you know that idea of okay this this will make us all pull together i mean you could argue that coronavirus was the threat that 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 posed um that posed that kind of mortal end to the human race uh but i don't feel internationally the world's any closer um but yeah, listen, I, 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 I was going to say, though, I was going to say about this idea of enmity. Um, I wonder if, when you're talking about combatants that essentially live side by side, is there a sense of looking in the mirror? Is there a sense of being offended by the people who are so similar to you? And... Is there a sense of being offended that, in a way that they're, they're, they're so similar and yet the point of difference, the one or two points of difference, have them believe that they're better than you and that's the source of your rage. Like, how dare you? How dare you think you're better than us just because you drink that kind of tea and not this kind of tea. How dare you think you're better than us just because you like that football team and we like this football team. Um, because sometimes it feels as as superficial as that. But if you bring it down, if, you, if, we, if we bring the scale right down to a relationship, a romantic relationship, your partner, your spouse boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever. And you think at times of conflict, you're staring at each other across a divide and each of you feels affronted. 
each of you may feel yeah each of you may feel like you're the wronged party each of you may feel like you're the the better person um and there's there's huge hurt and huge judgment and yet there's there is there's something bonding there as well there you know there has to have been because otherwise why would you have been together in the first place so there's this kind of bitter sweet intense closeness and proximity an intense knowledge of each other and yet you find yourselves completely at odds um and completely repelled um that's an interesting that's an interesting component isn't it like you think on one level it's much much easier to get on with people who are at far greater distance from you than the people who live right next door um and you know when when i say right next door i mean you can use that figuratively i mean that could be literally your next door neighbor if you want to go down that road but it could be the people in the village over it could be the person in the bed beside you imagine that you don't have to imagine it some of you i'm sure <laughs> um but that's uh you know if if you can't get the people who are closest to each other to reconcile what are what are the chances of i don't know like this is the thing you don't know someone you don't know someone until you live with them isn't it? that that's the uh, that's the truism isn't it and do you think if we go back to india and pakistan um maybe nobody knows indians better than pakistanis and vice versa and maybe in in the north during the troubles um the different sides of the conflict felt that way about each other like to know to know your you know you have to know your enemy fully to you know to be able to to be able to fully hate them and to fully engage in their destruction um and i i i i hearken back to that episode uh was it the the it wasn't the anniversary episode it's one before the episode 52 wasn't it when i was talking about um the 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 the, the nazi the nazi officer in quentin tarantino's inglorious bastards um played by christoph waltz 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 let's waltz no let's waltz let's waltz christoph waltz and he was the 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 Jew hunter and he relished capturing persecuting executing Jewish people in, in in Tarantino's story and he laid out his his sort of pathological hatred of Jewish people and it was really and it was the way he did it was to demonstrate how well he knew them and knew how they acted and knew how they behaved and knew how they thought and it's an illustration then of of what I'm talking about, knowing the you know knowing the source of your hatred so well. Um, yeah. So look, there's um, that's a that's a, that's a that's a not such a cheery note to finish on, but finish on it I will because that is just over an hour, and I need to go and get scalped by the barber. Um, I hope you enjoyed what you heard there today. It's a shorter episode than usual. It's been a long time since I've brought it in around the hour mark, but I've done it. And yeah, thanks for listening. As always, I really appreciate it. And I look forward to having my bloody voice back. This is driving me mental. You can throw me some love on social media if you want to. I'd welcome it. I welcome an old comment, an old bit of feedback. Um, don't be shy. Don't be shy. Share the love. Uh, you can find me on Facebook. The Clear Out Podcast is on Facebook. The Clear Out Podcast is on Instagram and YouTube. The Clear Out 2 is on Twitter. And you can always email me if you like at theclearoutlive at gmail.com. And if you want to support this tell, this show, this tell uh, financially, you can do so using the supporter link, which will be there in the description wherever you're listening. 
or if you want to become an ongoing contributor to the show, you can do so using the Patreon link. That is patreon.com forward slash the clear out. And I'd welcome anything you can give. Otherwise, just listen, share, recommend, subscribe, whatever you can do to support what I'm doing here. I greatly appreciate. Okay, that's it. Go with Muhammad El Baradi and let's let's aspire to a, a more unified place to live in. A bit more harmony, a bit more getting along with each other, a bit more recognising how we're so similar and that's not going to change anytime soon even if it annoys the hell out of us okay mind yourselves i'll talk to you real soon all the best bye